And hi everyone, welcome to Life Edge, because life uh, just doesn't have to be mediocre. I'm Briggs Zanotti, and I'm joined today by my good friend and co-host, Dr. Susan Nash. Susan, how are you today? I'm festive. See my poinsettias yes, in the background. Yes, it looks very nice, very Christmassy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's great. And uh, in studio, we've got Harold Muliati. He's running the uh, video switcher and our video producer. And Susan, would you like to introduce our guest today? Yes, we have a, a, a great privilege of having Norm Sidlowski, who is from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and former um, former executive of the SEM Group. So he has a lot of insights about the economy and, and energy and all sorts of things. That's great. Well, here we go. This show is sponsored by Relay Corporation. Digital learning development, media development, corporate video, management consulting, and more. Visit us at www.relate.com. Thanks. And we're back and in that center position of power, as we like to call it, it's Norm. How are you, Norm? Very fine, very fine. Thank you, Rick. Thank you for coming on. So we're so glad that you're here. and. It's just such an you have such an interesting background, and I, I was um, glad to actually get to know you through the Tulsa Global Alliance because we, we had a group of, of executives and, and energy um, entrepreneurs from around the world, and you had a lot of interesting things to say, and I thought it would be really great to have you here. And so, anyway, um, would, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, how you got into energy? Absolutely, and thank you so much, uh, Susan, for letting me join you and Rick here today. It's it's a delight for me, and a special privilege to be able to uh, to chat today on on Life Edge. And and uh, my background is is uh, mostly business, lots of different companies, and uh, uh, more in my later career, energy companies, as you had mentioned. I was very fortunate to be the CEO of Sem Group corporation headquartered here in in Tulsa and uh, uh, since then since retiring a few years ago uh, I've also had a great privilege to serve on a number of different uh, energy boards different kinds alternative energy uh, startups and uh, technology ventures but in the past uh, uh, my career was 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 one of great fortune that I got an opportunity with Chevron particularly to travel around the world and participate in many different countries, countries I know that you've been in and enjoyed visiting and different cultures. Uh, and uh, it, it was it was quite enjoyable. And in uh, one of my series, just to round that out, uh, and the reason I got involved, as you mentioned, Susan, uh, you and I were on the uh, State Department program a week or so back. Uh, I had got a call one day from the Pentagon, and the Pentagon said, uh, you know, we, we got this reference from you, and we'd like you to come work for us in, in Iraq, and we need your help, and uh, uh, it's time we need to get the oil sector back on its feet, and you have some experience that seems to fit, uh, so can you be in Kuwait on Monday? and uh, help us out and when i went home and told my wife she said who called and they wanted <laughs> you to do what and be where and uh and in any event it was a tremendous tremendous uh, kind of one of those life experiences that i uh, so much enjoyed and felt like i gained a lot so lots of places lots of international things and lots of energy oh that's amazing so i know that a group from iraq came in from with um last year the Tulsa, and I was wondering if you were uh, involved with that same group that was yes. with the State Department. Yeah. Yes, yes, I've done um, a group that uh, our colleagues there at the Tulsa Global Alliance uh, brought in from the state, and also uh, in years past uh, with Oklahoma City has a group where they mm -hmm. bring in uh, international visitors on the State Department Leadership Program. So it, it was nice, uh, Susan, and I got a chance to uh, 
uh, reconnect and uh, practice the three words I know in Arabic and uh, and <laughs> kind of touch base with what's happening from their perspective on the ground. Because often I think today we all get so much news and I, and I love it and I love the connection and, and I can get so, I feel, up to date with all the news feeds rolling in. Uh, but it's still just critically important, I think, to get a chance to talk to people that are on the ground and get their perspectives and, and get a little bit of a culture capsule, not just what we see in headlines. Oh, absolutely. I, I know that that's, we just get one usually very slanted version. I know that Rick has often talked about that because he's, he's originally um, from Argentina and his, and he's lived there. And, and it's interesting to, to hear him talk about the difference between how people talk about, say, hyperinflation and, and what it was like to actually be there. <laughs> Living in, in it was highly overrated. It wasn't that much fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you you would get up in the morning, buy a pair of jeans for thirty five dollars. That afternoon, it was now fifty dollars. The next day, it's a hundred. You just go, oh yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, yes. it was it was definitely an, an interesting thing. That was back in the uh, nineteen seventy seven to nineteen eighty time frame when I flew back. I was born there, but I've, I've been here my whole life since I was three years old. But I went back for three years. It was an interesting experience. I worked in in international banking there and. Um, and and it was just a fascinating time uh, that was during the military government and everything. So hyperinflation is not a, a fun thing. And and having been in banking and having seen what inflation was like, I marvel at the miracle of what we do with money right now. We have no inflation, <laughs> in essence, where we should be probably 2,000% inflation at the rate we're going. But... Yeah, it's just interesting between quantum easing and um, and how we manage money. We are a perfect example of reputational solidity. Our reputation keeps our money valuable rather than the amount we print. That's that's pretty amazing. I couldn't agree more, Rick. I think you make some good points there about uh, money. And uh, I guess in one sense, it's nice to be in the U.S., uh, as opposed to other countries, just because we tend to get the dollar benefit mm -hmm. of being the reserve currency, and also in the energy business, obviously, uh, oil is almost always traded in in dollars. Uh, but I do worry, uh, and uh, you bring up a good point with Argentina, and I think we we uh, Susan and I had a discussion with uh, one of the folks uh, on this effort that we mentioned from Venezuela, and mm -hmm. uh, and the Bolivar has. I mean, it's just astronomical. I mean, it's just uh, incredible, the, the sad devaluation of the currency there. And now in the face of some of the other issues, uh, I don't know how countries uh, manage or get through this. It's going to be difficult. Yeah, it will be. Argentina's not much better. Their, their peso is mm. worth nothing, nothing. Um, in the last three years, it went from, I think, 10 pesos or 13 pesos per dollar. Now it's Officially, I think it's around 80 or 90, but unofficially, if you want to buy dollars in Argentina, it's something like 200. Uh, so not many people can travel right now or do much of anything else. They're locked down pretty heavily, too, so they've had that mm -hmm. issue. Uh, it's an interesting place to be right now. I know a lot of people there still, and they're just going, if only we could get out. <laughs> That's what they're thinking. And unfortunately, yes. the, the common myth that they have to go through and It'd be pretty sad is that they may become the next Venezuela, and that's oh, that's a disaster for South America. Yeah, that is country. just so sad. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it, I think um, I, I'm interested too. Like, what what? How does one attract investment in a time of, of like lockdowns or complete instability? One of the things that the company or countries wanted to do is they wanted to get investors in. Venezuela, mm -hmm. Afghanistan, and yeah. I mean, that's that's a tough road. And I, I was wondering, Norm, what do you think countries and states should do? Oh, gosh, I wish I had a, a solution. And uh, Rick may have a better view of that on me being a background in investment banking. But I, I think I was looking at some of the numbers today from uh, Turkey and uh, in terms of GDP improvement over this pandemic period here this year. And uh, they did far better than I had thought, uh, but they did it with investment coming from the government. So the Turkish government is supporting it. And 
And, and I think they're probably going to run into the very things we were talking about earlier with Argentina and Venezuela, ultimately. But in the near term, uh, it, it's pretty difficult. There are funds. Uh, you know, uh, you all have probably worked, uh, as I have a little bit, with uh, uh, the uh, uh, groups in Washington that uh, work on development, not just the World Bank and, and, and uh, such, but uh, um, those are areas that are providing money in, in often and even from the U.S. government money for foreign direct investment. Mm -hmm. uh, and but they're the kind of the the where you go when the risk level gets so high that uh, uh, folks in businesses or private equity really um, uh, are, are held back from investing in some yeah. of these projects. <clears throat> Yeah, like the IMF is is really pretty much just rescuing people or trying to get money back that they've lent people for many, many years. And yes. it's almost, if you look at the IMF, I don't know how much money they ever get back. It seems like it all goes out, but not too many people pay it back, Argentina being one of them. I think they've borrowed uh, six or seven times already. I think it's somewhere between 30 and 40 billion each time. It's never been paid back, and now they're doing it again. So... It, it, it's a tough one. It's it's a risky investment. It, like, that's why none of the private people want to get into it because there's a good chance you won't make anything out of it. Now, what but what those countries do offer is cheap labor, and in some cases, like Argentina and, and a lot of other countries, they've got natural resources. China is mm -hmm. heavily courting Argentina right now because of all the natural resources, including uranium and other things. So there's a lot of interest in that. The U.S. was involved heavily at one point. I don't know if they were involved as much. They were involved in petroleum, in wheat, in, mm -hmm. and all sorts of other things. I'm not sure how much we're involved anymore. So, you know, but China is definitely getting involved in Argentina. They've they've been sort of bailing them out a little bit, along with the IMF. So that's just one one more example. Now, now, Norm, what do you think of our economy? I, you know, you hear so many different things. You know, one, one, one group will tell you we're dying, we're going to explode, we will be Venezuela ourselves. Another group says life looks great, we're doing better than ever. <laughs> you know, it's it's all over the the map. Where, what, what, where do you think we are? Uh, I suppose, Rick, as usual, I'm probably in the middle and thinking through that. Yeah. I, yeah, uh, I was watching the, you know, a lot of us in the energy business. Uh, and Susan would tell you we're watching the OPEC plus mm. meeting uh, today and trying to gauge how that might affect uh, because in, in the energy world, it's uh, it's it's kind of a, not only the trauma with the pandemic and yep. the drop in demand for mm. air, air fuel, you know, fuels to put sure. the airplanes up and transportation and so, but also um, it's been an issue of supply and there mm. is a lot of supply coupled with this drop in demand uh, energy industries you probably saw too in recent months uh, big energy companies have wrote down from their balance sheets 80 billion dollars mm. uh, and yeah. it's uh, it's pretty sobering at the moment uh, have, have but all things what, considered yeah go ahead have you heard about the airlines they're claiming worldwide airlines will lose 150 billion this year yeah, it's mind-boggling, and wow. it's 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 a little scary. I grew up with the my dad was with the airlines for twenty five years, and I'm just going, wow. It's I mean the airlines have mm. gone through a lot of ups and downs throughout the years, but this is just mind-boggling. Well, and also that um, well, I, I just am saying this because I bought some Carnival Cruise Line stock. <laughs> <laughs> I think eventually they'll come back, but this it'll be a while. And can you imagine how they're being devastated? And yeah. I didn't buy much. I, think I bought two twenty shares. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 really challenging to know as a, as a potential investor. You know what do you do right now? And I suppose we'd all like to have bought Moderna and Pfizer and some others a little earlier, but uh, uh, tech stocks seem to be doing pretty well. Uh, retail seems to be uh, mixed. You know, Walmart is doing wonderfully well, Target, but then other retail stores, uh, Kohl's and others, aren't doing so well. I, no. But I think, uh, to your original question to me, Rick and Susan, I think, I think the economy uh, probably the end of next year is going to be on a strong, uh, strong uptick here in the U.S. I, I, I suspect, as I listen to the experts, that 
the virus is going to be with us uh, into most of the first half of the next year before we can declare victory, I think. And uh, and that's going to continue to sap things like flying and, and airplane stocks and, and transportation. Yeah. Yeah, and it just makes you think, I mean, you know, a few years ago, well, actually even before the pandemic, I was thinking, you know, a lot of um, companies and, and communities have decided to do uh, festivals and travel and tourism as their their primary um, engine of growth, and that that area has just been savaged. And then it, and then the idea, well, okay, we can do three D printing, you get back into manufacturing, you can diversify that way, is is a good idea. And then also automation, but it still keeps um, individuals from really being able to get the kind of jobs that were in growth areas. So I don't know, what do you see, like for example, in the energy industry in terms of, of electricity and, and um, the kind of, of transition? Do you see that as generating jobs? I think, Susan, the transition is the key word. And, and I do see uh, uh, jobs. Uh, I think we have to be careful thinking through that. Uh, uh, you may have seen The Economist next week's edition. Uh, we'll talk a lot about coal and the how the coal industry has declined so much mm -hmm. in the world, but in the U.S. Uh, it's still on the uptake in, in Asia and uh, a lot of energy produced there by coal. But your, your point about transition, to me, uh, speaks very strongly to what we need to be thinking about in the energy industry. Uh, I think natural gas will continue to have a strong, strong future uh, in, in energy, electricity production, and uh, providing of uh, industrial demand. Um, but we need to be looking to uh, technology to help us with things like uh, uh, carbon capture and uh, things like hydrogen and uh, uh, alternatives that will transition us because the the issues around climate um, are here and and they're important and uh, I know we've got a, a new president elect that's got some different ideas than our current president about um, energy and energy transition uh, but it's a worldwide issue and and, uh, and in the end I think uh, Yes, there'll be more jobs, but they'll be different. And sadly, sadly for many of my colleagues, I think we're going to continue to see reductions in the workforces in a lot of traditional energy until things like alternatives and wind and solar and uh, green hydrogen and others kind of catch the wind behind their sails and, uh, and increase and provide some more employment. Now, what do you think about, well, actually, let, let me rephrase this. If you had to put on your magic cap and predict what industry would really be the biggest growth industry over the next, let's say, five years, who do you think comes out benefiting from what's been going on right now? Well, I think uh, I think to answer your question, I think we have to be really careful. I think uh, alternative energy will benefit dramatically and is already. Uh, when you look at the cost of solar panels, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, both in silicon and uh, cadmium telluride, uh, uh, it's getting to price points that uh, are really attractive for industrial, not only industrial grade, but residential. And wind, wind has come down dramatically. So alternative energy will benefit a lot. But we've got some significant, as you two know well, some issues that we've got to solve with some technology. And part of it's battery technology, mm -hmm. part of it's the electric grid, uh, to, to kind of make this all work. And, and that's why the transition word is so important because it won't happen in, in 2021. It's going to no. take some time. <laughs> It'll yep. take a while. But alternatives, I think, are, are really a good bet for the future to answer well, your question. That's interesting. Elon Musk was talking the other day about battery, in fact, battery technology, saying it's not so much the technology that's the problem. It's getting the the, the minerals, the ores, everything you need to build the batteries, there's, there's, it's pretty depleted right now. They're looking for more sources of, of, of minerals and supplies to make them. And he said that's our biggest issue over the next probably five, ten years, which I thought was interesting. I thought we had enough. No, he says we're, we're low according to, what, to his estimates. And 
and how it's going to affect his production and and other things. They've got batteries designed right now that will probably be released within two to three years, but they don't have enough to make them yet, yet. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's going to be interesting to see where where all that goes. Um, We have a problem here in California where they went very solar on some things, or actually they went wind, and they did some solar too, and they're realizing it wasn't enough to power a large amount. We have 40 million people here. It, it can't even come close to powering us, as we've discovered with fires and everything else. The whole, the whole grid just started collapsing, especially in areas that said, we don't need any more electrical. They couldn't keep up. So that's one of the issues that we're seeing here as, as a big state with a lot of people, that it's hard for the, for the power suppliers like Edison um, to, to come up with enough power for the number of people especially when you have hot days or, or, or windy days and they have issues with lines and everything else. But also, where they are going more alternative, it's not meeting the demands. And unfortunately, and this is, I, a lot of people don't like this alternative, but nuclear has been proven pretty safe. And the newer versions of nuclear, as far as waste materials, are very small. They're, they're, they can put an enormous amount into very small areas now for waste. So it's not like it used to be. But here in the U.S., we have that stigma that nuclear bad, nuclear not good. And it's kind of a shame because so many things do use nuclear. And other countries are using it quite well, but we're not. I mean, we're, we're probably deprecating nuclear quite a bit. What, what do you think about that? I, I couldn't agree more on the nuclear. I, I, I'm so disappointed that we haven't been able to get some resolution and solution. But uh, some of the small nuclear plants, uh, some of the small hmm. energy production seems like it's a real productive technology. Yeah. But but I'm afraid you're right. And it brings me to thinking, as you were making your comments, Rick, about uh, the rest of the world and some of the other forces that are in play, uh, just speaking to minerals. And, you know, if, you, if all the cobalt in the world is in the Congo, uh, you, you know, now we're talking about some other macro uh, and geopolitical issues, mm-hmm. uh, uh, like the influence of China and the rise sure. of China in the world. Uh, uh, you know, they're going to—they're keen to put up all the 5G networks in Argentina and South America, and they're working hard on Belt and Road. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, but they're also very carefully acquiring minerals and yes. making sure that they have enough minerals to supply this. So. Uh, there's a lot of things in play, uh, but but the bottom line for me in terms of what do we look like for the future, uh, I heard someone describe it as it's going to be an energy as an and world, not an or. And mm. we just need all of these pieces and all of these sources to the extent we can make them fit together to get to the point where we need to be. Uh, and, and what we need for developing economies and, and future livelihoods for everybody in the world. Oh, I totally agree. And I think that one of the things, too, that we're not looking at, and it's just a matter of time, are the fact that the, a lot of the hydroelectric dams that we've counted on, hmm. they're, the reservoirs are silting up and they're, they're, not, they're not providing the water they need to the, country, to the communities, but they're not providing as much electricity as they used to. So we need to replace that. And I was thinking probably a big growth area would be, I mean, eventually we will have to go back to some nuclear, but if we have, uh, do we have enough copper wire for, for, for putting the transmission lines across the, the, the nation? I mean, we, thinking ahead and all, not just the, the, the power itself and not, not just the geopolitical pieces, but every single thing in the supply chain, it, well, it Susan, gets complicated. Well, Susan, you know who has most of the copper? Chile. That's right. Mm-hmm. They're large. Mm-hmm. They have huge copper mines. That's a comma. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if the Chinese are there too. I think they might be. Um, but you know, we would we've been talking, Norm, over the last several shows about China has one big Achilles heel right now, and the Indians just south of them are pointing a lot of missiles at that Achilles heel, and that's the Three Gorges Dam. There's nothing in the news about very little, but you know, India and China are, are at least posturing that they're going to go into a war. They've had skirmishes already with people killed, but India moved an enormous amount of missiles, um, 
high speed, high altitude, and other kinds of missiles pointing at the Three Gorges Dam. Because if they take That's out great. the Three Gorges Dam, that takes out 70% of China manufacturing. That's pretty scary mm-hmm. for China. You know, they can't defend against multiple missile attacks like that. And I think they're aware of that. So there's a, there's a tense area or there's, there's a tension building up there that you always wonder, what are they going to do now? Uh, because if they take out China, that takes us out. That takes just about everybody out. E- interesting. That's a scenario. I'm just c- putting out a scenario that people are talking about, but nobody's talking about it in the mainstream media. It's not even there. I, I've heard this through different sources, and, and it is in foreign media. They talk about it, but we don't. And it's just fascinating, some of the things going on. I, I think it was Japan, Taiwan, and India have signed a pact to help each other if, in case China attacks. So there's a little bit of risk playing uh, on the board out there in the real world of who's going to move where, what pieces are being moved into place, and and the, the, the uh, weaknesses of each of these countries and their manufacturing and or other production processes. Just like we have weaknesses, so do they. Oh, you're well said. And and, and you both are right about the supply chain. Uh, it makes me think about that and the interaction of how interdependent so many uh, countries and, and others. And mm-hmm. I, I remember years ago, uh, uh, I think Thomas Friedman wrote a couple of books about, uh, you know, how the world's getting closer together and how if, you know, when two countries get McDonald's, you know, it's going to it's gonna inoculate us from the potential of these kinds of flashpoints yeah. leading to... Uh, to potentially war, but but I'm not so sure anymore, and 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 it's a worry. I I just wish we could come together on something. I don't know what it is, climate yeah. change or something that would get get various countries to kind of get past some of these uh, potential flashpoint issues and work together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's interesting because things that you would think would unite us, like trying to come up with. Um, a strategy to to deal with with COVID. Actually, I, I was reading today about the um, emergence of uh, vaccine nationalism, and mm-hmm. how some vaccines will be accepted for, for by some and not others. And <laughs> yes, terrifying. I mean, so that I mean, so more fragmentation. It's still. I think we all bring our own um, vested interests, and sometimes we. In the media and everything else, as we all talk about, uh, there's an echo chamber that kind of reinforces that things. But I, I always felt like, uh, just going back to your first question of me uh, and, and what I did, is when I had a chance to go to different countries and to talk to people and get a little bit of a cultural curiosity satisfied, um, uh, there's a lot. there's just so much common ground mm-hmm. if we allow it. And we can get past, we can realize that most people everywhere, uh, you know, value fundamentally the same th- things that, that we do, kids, our grandkids, uh, y- you know, mm-hmm. people's livelihoods, and uh, we can get past some of these things that uh, get us all uh, spun up and, and at arm's length and, and worse in, in, in trying to deal with things. And uh, uh, I don't know, working together, maybe it's euphemistic. <laughs> But I think uh, I think there's a lot more too if we could figure out how to do it than, than staying apart and following our own flags. Yeah, that's well said. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's that's actually yeah. very well said because frankly, people you know anybody who's ever traveled realizes people do get along, and it can be all mm-hmm. sorts of diverse cultures. People, a smile can go a very long way, and uh, it is pretty amazing how I think we're much like you said we have much more in common than not. In many cases, it's just that we have a, a, this problem with just ourselves, I think. <laughs> just, I don't yeah. know. It's sort of interesting. Um, go ahead, Susan. Well, I, I totally agree. And, and we were thinking, I was thinking about just historically, it, it, with trade and commerce has been a necessity. I mean, even like the Aztecs were, were the, that they kept the trade routes open. They That's how they grew. I mean, just all kinds of Silk Road, on and on. And, oh, it looks like I've frozen here. <laughs> anyway, but at any rate, 
I was thinking too, if we think back to our actual, our brains and we have our limbic system. So we have the reptilian brain that, and, and that re reacts. And if that's triggered, our, um, our, our actual rational brain just can't work. And so I think that, that if we can just keep from triggering ourselves and the media is not helping, but we can, we can be more rational. No, that's you're right, Susan. And I think I think the other thing for me has been, uh, you know, to try and uh, it's not so much not take myself so seriously, but but try and be not only objective, but not um, think I I know a lot of things. Uh, when I I you know I'm a I'm a Catholic boy from the South Side of Chicago, so I got sent to uh, Iraq and to Baghdad. And, and sadly, I thought I knew everything about it. You know, I had read a couple books. I'd been to the Middle East. Uh, and, and every day I was in Iraq was a new learning day for hmm. me. You know, I, and I just, I just keep going back to that and trying to remember that, uh, you, you know, you've got you to gotta be present and you've got to listen hard and you've got to realize that, you know, you can add a lot to your knowledge because... Uh, Nobody, nobody knows everything. Norm, before we wrap up, what what's in your future? Well, I hope a vaccine. Uh, but other than that, Rick, I think, uh, uh, thank you for the question. I, I think I'm just keen to pursue uh, different activities and uh, I'll continue to serve on different um, corporate boards and uh, philanthropic boards and... Uh, and just hope I can continue to connect. Uh, this media and uh, Zoom and some of the other have been really good for me because I'm one of those that that we all, all three of us, I think, were that I spent more time in airports and on airplanes than I could yeah. possibly imagine. And uh, yeah. it's been nice. It's been nice to be able to connect with people and to connect with things of, uh, of varying interest to to kind of keep things going and, and uh, stay active and stay lively. That's great. And we have one final question, which is what we ask everybody. What was it in your life? Because you've, you've had a great life from what you're saying, and, and I've read a little bit of your biography. What was it that gave you that edge, that edge that made you who you are? I think I would go back, Rick, to just um, both uh, intellectual and cultural curiosity and and, and I don't know, I, I guess I, I've got to be careful after what I just said before about saying I have an edge. But I think people, uh, I think for me, when opportunities arose, uh, I thought about them carefully and, and I was able to take them, whether it was moving around the country, taking a different job, taking a promotion, taking a lateral job, but uh, thinking about those opportunities and, uh, and just taking those has really been beneficial to me and I felt so good about it that I, uh, if people ask me that question, I, I think that's my answer and hopefully that would be helpful to them too. That's great. Oh, that's really wonderful. And it takes courage to, to actually take and walk into something new. So that's, that's really admirable. Well, you both are very kind to say that. And I'll just tell you both again, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, on the program and, and letting me join you too. It's been a great education and conversation for me. So thank you again. Yeah, we appreciate you coming on and, and definitely enjoyed it. We wish you the best in what you're, because you're embarking kind of on a new life too right now. You've, you've started, I think you sold off the company where you, where you were, and now you've got all sorts of new opportunities. That's exciting. Um, maybe in a year or so you can come back on and tell us what you're doing because I have a feeling it's going to be fun. <laughs> it will definitely be fun and it'd be lovely to be back that sounds great that'd be great well if you're watching the show please subscribe and, and engage with us too if you have any questions for Norm you can put them down in the notes below we are live on LinkedIn right now uh, so you uh, we're also going to be re-uploading the show uh, afterwards because we're recording too we're putting it up on YouTube and Facebook so take a look at the show and if you have any questions just put them down there and we will get answers for you have a good one, everyone. Thanks for showing up, and we'll see you next week. Norm, again, a pleasure. Susan, as always. Thank you. Thank you again. Bye-bye.